Hi, shalom to all our friends uh, out there, family, friends, and colleagues of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Uh, I'm Dan Dyker, sitting here in Jerusalem with our president, uh, Ambassador Dr. Dory Gold, on the occasion of the presentation, the publication of Jewish Lives Matter, which is uh, the latest publication of one of uh, Jerusalem Center's distinguished colleagues, uh, Fiamma Nerenstein, uh, and, and many, uh, many of you know uh, uh, Fiamma through her uh, nearly 20 books that she's written and thousands of articles on the issues of anti-Semitism uh, and Israelophobia over the last three decades. And, uh, you know, there's, a, there's an old American movie in, in which a, a, a mafia movie when it says, I think I smell a rat. And Fiamma has, has been smelling a rat on the issue of anti-Semitism and its, and its profound connection, not only to the Jewish people wherever they are globally, but in fact, to the uh, Jewish state, to the collective, uh, to the, to the collective uh, Jewish community in, uh, in Israel. And uh, th this really uh, gives us great context for this latest book, Jewish Lives Matters, Human Rights and Anti-Semitism. And we'll just say it raises many, many questions. Uh, that are directed at the human rights community, uh, which established after the Second World War as a as a uh, institutional response to anti-Semitism, and what uh, Fiamma has been doing for decades. And I think there is a climax in this particular uh, monograph, hundred-page uh, monograph uh, uh, publication, is to say how is it that the human rights community has weaponized human rights, advanced anti-Semitism. Uh, genocidal anti-Semitism, as uh, Professor Erwin Cutler has said uh, repeatedly, uh, in the name of human rights, and it, so this is this is a uh, a serious uh, a serious institutional problem, uh, and uh, the human rights community um, must will be reading this book, I trust, and has many questions to answer. Now, to to assess this phenomenon today, we are really blessed to have a a, a panel of some of really some of the world's leading experts on Israelophobia, uh, what they call uh, uh, bigotry, Zionism, uh, uh, anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism, both in its contemporary and historical forms. Uh, and um, I'd, like to introduce, um, I'd like to introduce the panel just directly to you before I call on each uh, individual uh, panelist. I'll just start uh, from my left. Uh, uh, Andrea Levin is the founder and director of Camera, which is the oldest, uh, the most veteran uh, uh, worldwide media monitoring uh, uh, group in the world. In the world, uh, and I've been I've been blessed to know Andrea for a number of uh, decades. Camera has done extraordinary work on various continents, including Israel, and in starting in the United States in 1982 during the Second Lebanon War, when this type of uh, Soviet-sponsored PLO political warfare started. Uh, uh, in earnest uh, 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 from Lebanon uh, against uh, uh, the Jewish state. And Camera has been a pioneer and a leader constantly over the last few decades in monitoring, critiquing, and, uh, and presenting policy solutions for this, uh, for this type of media uh, bias that has really uh, transformed into media anti-Semitism. Uh, and then we go to Ruthie Bloom, um, a, a, a great colleague, uh, a great commentator, um, and a columnist with the Jerusalem Post and with JNS uh, News, and uh, she writes all over the place and uh, has been redistributed over the over the place. Also has written a great, also wrote a great book a number of years ago about the uh, uh, the, the Carter Obama and uh, and the challenges that uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, the United States is facing for itself um, on the uh, global scene with respect to this particular problem. Ambassador Ron Dermer is the second longest uh, serving uh, ambassador in Israel's history in the United States, other than Abba Eben, uh, who served from 1950 to 1959. Ron served as U.S. Ambassador of the United States from 2013 to 2000, just about 2022 or mid 2021. Uh, did I get that right, Ron? You're the second longest serving. No, uh, you, you got it wrong, but I know that in most of your work, almost all of your work you're always good on details i'm the third longest <laughs> abe Harmon. abe Harmon was abba ibn's immediate successor and he uh, also served for nine years but since 1967 i'm the longest that's great okay, so, all right so it was it was it was accurate since 67 okay i'll, I'll take that credit. Right. but we and, know uh, that the fight against this goes back to 48 so you got to be accurate all the way back then. exactly that's true well the truth is if you take Haj, <laughs> Hussaini, it goes back to the 1920s so i'm doubly right. wrong that's right. Uh, 
Okay, I stand corrected. I, and I actually researched it last night uh, 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 in a number of few places, but I didn't get the Abe Harmon part. Um, you mean something written about me online was not true? I am shocked. <laughs> no, well, I, I am I call, shocked. Well, Ambassador, I called Barack Ravid to do the fact checking. Okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, Professor Charles Small is the is the founder and executive director of ISGAP, uh, for the Institute for the International Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy. Uh, and uh, uh, Charles has been is a, a, an illustrious uh, academic career at at, uh, at Cambridge, at Yale, uh, um, uh, in multiple continents, and is sought is sought after as a a commentator, analyst, expert on anti-Semitism. Um, and of course, ISGAP is today chaired by Natan Sharansky, uh, who together with Ron uh, wrote uh, one of probably one of the most important books on anti-Semitism and freedom and democracy uh, called The Case for Democracy, um, which had a profound, uh, profound influence on the Bush administration uh, and, uh, and really the American discourse, I think going forward. And as Ron, as you'll see, Fiamma, was very much influenced by the whole concept of 3D, the three Ds in terms of determining the similarities between collective anti-Semitism. Uh, when one wears the 3D glasses that uh, one clearly saw were the indicators of individual anti-Semitism. Uh, so we'll get into that in, in just a moment. What I'd like to do now is just to add, to ask uh, President Ambassador Dr. Dory Gold, just to say a few words about uh, you know, the context that we find ourselves in today uh, with regard to Jewish Lives Matter and the larger problem of, I think it's, it's, it would not be an exaggeration to say, unprecedented levels of political violence, anti-Jewish bigotry and, and anti-Semitism of, of the political variety, uh, as Bernard Lewis of Blessed Memory was, trying to, was, in, was uh, so urgently trying to share with us uh, in the last years of his life. Dory, what's your, your sense? Look, whenever I read a book like this, there's always a... Um, phrase or a statement that comes to mind. And what came to mind and continues to come to mind with me is the following. It wasn't supposed to be like this. You know, we had um, basically institutional initiatives since the Second World War in fighting anti-Semitism. And that's what should have created a whole new framework. You know, I'm thinking about the, um, the work, the early work of the United Nations, which was actually very good before it was completely corrupted. And um, as I say, it wasn't supposed to be like that, but this is what has evolved and it is bad. And first we need to help the Jewish community and go well, broader than that to understand how bad it is and then come up with the recommendations of what to do. So I think Fiamma has always been a pioneer in doing these things. And that's why I'm so glad she's written this book at the Jerusalem Center and um, hopefully she'll help us with the follow-up. Absolutely, uh, I couldn't agree more. And in fact, what, you know, picking up on Dory's comments, what Jewish Lives Matters does, I think, it's a, it's a, it, it's really a call, a calling out of the the institutions that Dory just talked about that were designed to solve the problem and they've become the problem. Um, and and I remember Ron, uh, Ambassador Dermer had a statement with certain adversaries he met in the United States over his uh, long career in which he said, "Prove to me why you're not an anti-Semite." And, <laughs> and I think that that's the attitude that um, Jewish Lives Matter takes. And I think it's it's. As someone who's been working, who, who worked on this Israelophobia book a couple of years ago, with uh, together with uh, uh, Fiamma and and, uh, and and shared some of those ideas and, and took advice from Andrea and from Ruthie and spoke to Charles about it, uh, consulted with Charles about it, is is that this is really the cutting edge of of where we need to be today, where there is so much confusion in the West about what constitutes criticism, which Fiamma talks about in the book, what is real. Uh, critique and what is anti-Semitism? How do you how do you uh, split the difference? Well, it's not if you if you're a fact-based, rational-based thinker, it, it seems uh, uh, self-evident, but it clearly is anything but self-evident. So let's get started. I'd I'd be uh, delighted um, 
Uh, Ruthie Bloom, as, as I said before, regular columnist for JNS and winner of the, the Rappaport Prize for Excellence in Commentary and the author of, let me get the, the, uh, the title right, to Hell, in a Has to Hell in a Handbasket, Carter Obama and the Arab Spring. So you've been following this, uh, Ruthie, for years and writing about it. Um, share a few ideas with us for the next few minutes uh, just to help us get our thinking straight. Uh, and then we can further dis we can discuss further after we we've heard from all our distinguished commentators. Okay. More importantly, I've been reading Fiamma for many many years, um, and uh, she's been a big inspiration to me. And what I would like to do is start by talking a minute about singing to the choir. Fiamma says in her preface to the book that this book is more of an open letter to friends or former friends, decent people, otherwise decent people who have been, you know, swayed by all the propaganda and have let themselves, they are both um, swayed by it, uh, by the anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic propaganda and then promote it. And she says, these are otherwise decent people and she can't believe how they could buy into that. And therefore, the book is a letter, uh, both a, an accusation and defending against the accusations. And what she says is she dedicates this book to all those people who are not, who, who are dedicated to genuinely to the real meaning of human rights. So I, what, what's really important is that very often people say, well, the people who already are fighting and championing proper human rights don't need a book like Fiamma's, but that's not true. Um, all of us sitting here, we're like a choir. We are part of those people who are fighting for the truth about Israel and about the Jewish people and about democracy and about America and the West. And um, we need to reinforce one another and to reinforce other people. And that is a very important um, mission. And Fiamma accomplished that in this book in an amazing way because she actually sort of took together all the things she's been writing about and managed to uh, su almost summarize it and weave this fabric of, and, and bring it all together. The title is so brilliant. The, the aspect of this that I wanna talk about is intersectionality, because uh, this book has many, many aspects of and about anti-Israel and anti-Semitism. Um, the title of the book is so brilliant, Jewish Lives Matter, because of course it's a play on Black Lives Matter. And Fiamma points to the killing of George Floyd, the African-American in Minneapolis, who was killed by a sadistic police officer on May 25th, 2020. And this sparked uh, riots all over the place. Uh, now this had, George Floyd was not uh, killed by a Jew. There was nothing Jewish or Israeli about this incident. And yet the riots that it sparked and the Black Lives Matter movement that had already existed since 2013 had this resurgence. It also got a huge uh, injection of cash and um, it sort of took over the theme of these riots um, as though America is inherently racist, uh, which it isn't. But aside from that, a huge um, anti-Israel uh, anti vitriol came along with it. Uh, as though Israel had anything whatsoever to do with the George, George Floyd incident, no matter what you think of it. Suddenly it was, this is like a Palestinian issue um, as Fiamma describes in the book. Um, there were slogans all over social media. People had t-shirts um, showing uh, Palest uh, Israeli soldiers stepping on Palestinians necks, the way the policemen stepped on George Floyd's neck. You had Palestinian signs saying, I can't breathe. Um, this became a theme uh, of the Black Lives Matter movement. Now, it wasn't the first time that the Black movements, the activists, Black activists were encouraging anti-Semitism through anti-Zionism. The Students for Justice in Palestine, for example, um, joined forces with movements like Black Lives Matter, 
radical feminists. I can name, I, I can't name all the NGOs and the groups that, but what they are is a mixture of groups that the only thing that I would say they have in common is th their self-description as victims, victims of uh, victims of America, victims of Israel, women, victims of men. And this created a glue. And now as Fiamma also points to how anti, whenever there is a, a culture and a society is kind of slipping, anti-Semitism is in the air. And this was a great example. The cancel culture, uh, cancel culture in America is exactly that kind of decline in America that necessarily became accompanied by a huge wave of anti-Semitism. Um, now, Fiamma has been writing for years about how uh, the, you know, criticism of Israel, justified criticism of Israel is not what we're talking about, is not what she was talking about. Criticism is always legitimate, but mm -hmm. the double standards, the Sharansky's three Ds, uh, as you pointed out, um, Dan, the three Ds of demonization, double standards, and, uh, and what was the other one? Delegitimization. Um, that that distinguishes criticism of Israel from actual anti-Semitism. Now, the, the uh, getting back to what Fiamma's purpose in writing the book is she says, you know, how is it that this has been so successful? Or as Dory pointed out, how is it that after all these years of fighting so hard and oh, oh the and also the international, the uh, definition, the Holocaust, what do you call it? The international Holocaust. Yeah remember, I'm, I'm getting the name wrong of the definition um, that so many countries have signed on to, so many institutions um, claim that, they're, that they're, they're fighting against, uh, they're fighting on behalf of Holocaust remembrance, and yet anti-Semitism is flourishing rather than abating. And Afiyama has been really shouting about this for a long time, but this book brings it together in a very important way and also shows the connection between anti-Americanism and anti-Semitism. Again, um, both having to do with the value system um, that these are people who are fighting to destroy America and destroy Israel and the values, the Judeo-Christian values that make both of those countries so great and that you know, once made the rest of the West great. I'm not gonna talk about Western Europe now because I, I consider it to have already declined. You know, hopefully America hasn't reached that point yet. But what, I want, but what I'm saying is that this is crucial reading, especially for people who already know she's right. Um, we all here, we're a choir and we need to hear it because that kind of um, reiteration uh, of what we already know, but we need to be reminded and we need the facts of it and the details of it. Um, it's always really refreshing. And with that, I'll end my diatribe. <laughs> Thank you, Ruthie. It, it's very important, the type of uh, a, a clarity that you bring to the concept of intersectionality of anti-Semitism. I just make one uh, a comment uh, about the George Floyd and the BLM issue. You know, the BLM, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement that, as you rightly point out, began in 2013, is headed by self-declared Marxist-Leninist Patrice Cullors and, and, and Elisa Garza, mm -hmm. among others. And they've used uh, BLM as a weaponized uh, campaign against Jews and the Jewish state. Uh, and that was what was so extraordinary about Fiamma naming the book Jewish Lives Matter, because you can say, well, this is sort of a cute counterpunch to BLM. But I think it goes much, much deeper. Uh, it goes, this is Jewish Lives Matter is a call uh, to, uh, is a call for moral clarity for, for, for Western democracies. The BLM, uh, BLM was really a call for radical revolutionary Soviet against, uh, oh, yes. attacks against the foundations of democracy. And this is a clarion call on a warning that that type of organization uh, is, is looking to reconstruct uh, uh, the, uh, de the Western democratic system in its own Marxist-Leninist image. So I think it adds to the brilliance of, of Fiamma's use of that title 
because it really opens up a much deeper institutional, philosophical, ideological question about where the West is going itself. Let me yes, move and I'll on. I'll just add one more point to that. I'll just add one more point to that, Dan, and then I'll finish. And that is that the title Black Lives Matter implies that Black lives don't matter to uh, the institutions in America. Um, whereas Jewish lives matter, it's actually, whereas it, where Black lives matter, it's not true that Black lives don't matter in America. It is actually true that Jewish lives don't matter um, to anti-Semites, <laughs> if you want. Um, that's another irony with the title. Thank you, Ruth. That's a, that is another irony. And, and it, it raises another question that I hope that, that Ambassador Dermer will pick up because Ambassador Ron Dermer has been, has been talking about moral clarity since I've known him almost 27 years ago uh, as, a, as a foundational idea, moral clarity in the West. And, uh, uh, and, I, and Ron, I know that, that uh, you, you have suggested that you're gonna talk about moral collapse and moral clarity in the context of Jewish Lives Matter. And the question, Ron, is, is there really a chorus? I mean, Ruthie Bloom said, we're talking to the chorus. I'm wondering whether there really is a chorus anymore or whether there are a lot smaller choruses or many choruses that are going flat. Ambassador Dermer, uh, I don't need to introduce you any further. Uh, uh, take Stop. it away. Uh, thank you, uh, Dan. Let me pick up on what Ruthie just said. So when I, I had an opportunity to study political philosophy about 30 years ago, I remember there was a great debate about whether Socrates was a reactionary or a revolutionary. Now Socrates, you know, would go around Athens and he would ask people all these basic moral questions. And so the immediate response is to say, he's a revolutionary, he's breaking down the mores of the society. But there was actually a very powerful argument that uh, and these writers and thinkers, I remember saying, no, he actually, is a reactionary. What he's trying to do is he's trying to get people understand why they believe what they believe, because his concern is that the sophists are going to come in with certain language and they're going to be swept away in their nonsense. And so he knows that people have the right values in their gut, but he's afraid that they're not armed with the moral arguments to defend them. And so in this case, there is real benefit in preaching, hopefully not just to the choir, but to preach to the preachers. And, you know, we've got, I'm, I'm on a panel with many preachers, <laughs> and hopefully there'll be people joining us in the webinars who are preachers as well. But it's about giving people the arguments, yeah. giving people the, uh, uh, arming them to understand the facts so that they won't get rolled over. And something I hear, you know, as I was ambassador, and I'm sure all of you hear this as well, my kid goes to college, they don't know anything, and all of a sudden they get swept away from this gulf of hostility to Israel, and they don't even know how to begin to answer. So something like Fiamma's book also helps arm, I think, those people. And there is great importance in preaching to the choir and great importance to preaching to the preachers. And she is a preacher in chief uh, Fiamma, maybe maybe she's the Cohen Gadol of our of our preachers here. <laughs> Look, first first I want to thank you for including me in this uh, in this book launch. I have to start with a confession. I'm not unbiased when it comes to Fiamma. I think she's a, a a national treasure of our people. She has a combination of knowledge and passion that is exceedingly rare. I know a lot of passionate defenders of Israel. I know a lot of knowledgeable defenders of Israel. But she combines in herself those two things. And I think that's what really makes her in a really unique select few that I think are able to captivate people so much. And she also is someone who possesses something that's probably even rarer, which is real intellectual integrity. And I think her own, her own um, journey in her life to where she finds herself today, I think speaks to that intellectual integrity, to seeing the world as it is, to trying to understand it as it is, not to try to fit the facts into some preconceived notion, but to let the facts lead her to an understanding of the truth. And in that, I guess it's very Socratic in that way. And before I say something specifically about the book, I really want to uh, thank her. And the reason why I want to thank you, uh, Fiamma, I know it's going to embarrass you, but I'm going to say it anyway, <laughs> is that you have had such a distinguished career 
that no one would have blamed you for resting on your laurels <laughs> and not diving into the latest battle of ideas. We've been fighting these battles for decade after decade, and the Jews have been fighting it for century after century, these lies. But you've decided that you're just going to go get the armor and you're going to go right into the arena. And you've stayed uh, in this fight being more knowledgeable and even more passionate uh, than ever. And what always has struck me about Fiamma and those of you who are on this call who know her, I'm sure you agree with me, is that she has not been infected by the cynicism that can affect all of us who've been fighting this fight for so long. Uh, she continues to believe in fair-mindedness and in decency, and that if you make a sound argument, you can convince people of goodwill. I'm not sure if that's true anymore. Mm -hmm. I certainly hope it is uh, for all our sakes. But the fact that you believe this, I think, really spreads to other people. And it's a certain way of looking at the problem and gives optimism, not just of the importance of fighting it, but the possibility of succeeding. Now, and now to the book, Jewish Lives Matter. I read the book. I read it twice. And I would recommend to all of you that you read it twice. And I'll explain why. The first time I read it, I literally, I felt her passion in the writing. It's like somebody took their arm out of the book <laughs> and was sort of grabbing you and shaking you. Right. It was like Network, the guy on Network that says, <laughs> I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Was yeah. it Peter? Can't remember. Peter Finch. But Peter, Peter Finch. Finch. Thank you very much, Ruthie. It was the Peter Finch you know, that sense of outrage, it reads like a roller coaster of emotions, anger, pain, disappointment, all of these things. And she writes from the very first page, which I think Ruthie may have mentioned in the preface, that this is her chance not only to respond to the accusations against Israel, but to accuse. And she does that, I think, in a very powerful way. Not only does she defend Israel against defamation, she actually defames the defamers. And I think she does an important a service. Now, when I first read it, it reads just as an indictment against these defamers uh, and accusers of Israel. It exposes their lies. And frankly, it, it kind of makes a mockery of their hate, almost. <laughs> it becomes yeah. so absurd. And that is something that Fiyama has been doing for decades. As a journalist, I think with a great deal of subtlety uh, and grace. But the truth is, it was only when I read it a second time that I saw beyond the outrage to the depths of the idea it contains. Now, there are many ideas on this book. Some are hinted at and some she actually uh, lays out. But the core point, I think, Fiamma, and you're going to get a chance to correct me, you will get the last word with me today, that is for sure, <laughs> uh, is that this new anti, in this new anti-Semitic assault against Israel, the West is on a path toward destroying itself. Mm -hmm. This is the thing that you keep trying to say in the book. Now, that is not a new idea, okay, because casting the Jew as the canary in the coal mine of civilization, people have been talking about that for several decades. But Fiamma, I think, is saying something slightly different and much more profound. You see, the, uh, these proverbial fumes that kill the canary and threaten everyone else are not designed specifically to kill the canary. But Fiamma, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that these toxic fumes are designed to harm the Jewish state, but will end up endangering the entire world. And I think that is actually a new idea. Now, today, those fumes, and you hinted at this, Ruthie, and Dan did, they're the product of this cocktail um, mixed from various ingredients. You know, you could say it's intersectionality. I, intersectionality. I see it as social justice, human rights, anti-colonialism, pacifism, supposedly virtuous ingredients. And that cocktail proves so intoxicating that a well-meaning fool can think they are championing human rights when they are supporting Hamas, which is what you write in the book. It's good to support Hamas, a genocidal terror organization that not only doesn't care what about human rights, they don't care 
a wit about human life. Now, in writing this book, Fiam is helping expose the latest descent of the human rights industry. And I think it, today I would call it an industry more than a camp. Yeah. And she ex she exposes their descent into a world of of a moral collapse, a total lack of moral clarity. Now, Dan mentioned 18 years ago, I wrote a book with Natan Sharansky, which was his ideas. I just translated them into his Gulagi in Russian into English, <laughs> where we talked about the descent of human rights. Now, this book is written in 2004, and we explained what the first de descent was. And the first descent really was the refusal to separate free societies from fear societies, to make those more basic moral distinctions. Sharansky talks about the visit of Amnesty International to him. They ask him to speak in London. They leave behind their annual report. And he sees in this report all these pages on Israel and like a half a page, I think at the time he mentioned Saudi Arabia. And he was shocked that a human rights organization would target Israel in that way and make it seem as if Israel was the worst human rights violator in the world. And he says that you have to separate in his speech that he gave in London that year, this is 1986, you have to separate democracies, authoritarian societies and totalitarian societies. Because you have to appreciate that because of all the rights that you have in democratic societies and the ability to rectify human rights abuses in a democratic society, to actually correct the faults of a society, that the worst day of human rights violations in a democracy is better than the best day of human rights in what he calls a fierce society. But they refuse to do that. Now, I don't think that moral model was specifically designed to attack Israel. I think it was designed to protect the Soviet Union and its allies. It was in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, um, because then they could deflect the obvious charge that they're basically giant prisons. Because if we can make a muddle of there's no distinction between, uh, between democratic societies and non-democratic societies, and we're not going to draw that clear line between free and fierce societies, everything gets lost in that muddle. And it was used then as a battering ram to go after the West. Human rights were used during the Cold War as a battering ram by the Soviet Union, as outrageous as that sounds, to go after the West. But Israel certainly suffered by it. Now, you have the next stage where the battering ram becomes bigger. And how does the battering ram become bigger? And here Israel, I think, is much more the focus. And that is the refusal to draw a distinction between a democracy at war and a democracy at peace, right? To not make any distinction whatsoever. And that's how you have this theater of the absurd where you have terrorists targeting civilians and hiding behind civilians, okay? And they are seen as being on the same moral plane as a society that tries to protect their own citizens from attack and is doing everything to keep the citizens of the other side out of the harm's way. And you, you touch on that in the book and what has happened in war and that it becomes a body count and none of these distinctions are made and disproportionate violence because one side has more life. But the fact that a democracy at war would not be separated from a democracy at peace and that context is not given. I think that's the second stage in the descent uh, of human rights. Mm -hmm. And I think a large measure that, measure that was a product of attacks against Israel. Now, you can see that. Dory may have mentioned it. You see that in what happened with the ICC. The ICC is really the most grotesque thing that happened because this was actually started by Jews in terms of its idea following Nuremberg to be this court, like a permanent Nuremberg that would deal with the worst crimes against, uh, against humanity, that would deal with genocide. And yet, it, those are people who know the details of this, at the last minute, they shoved in as one of the great crimes against humanity, humanity Jews building apartments. That became part of the statute. <laughs> there was the, the, the statutes of the ICC. And they really poisoned the entire institution and the Palestinians rushing to the ICC for everything that happens. And the ICC agree, agreeing to give them a hearing. This is a problem, first and foremost for Israel, but it has actually neutered the entire organization. And it has become a joke on its way 
to what has happened to the UN Human Rights Council, which is more a function of being an amalgam of democracy and dictatorships that sit there. But the ICC didn't have to go this way. But because of the hostility towards Israel, that organization in this second descent was turned. Now we have the third descent. And this is where I think you are focused on. And that is you have this zeitgeist that is this intersectional claptrap that, uh, that Ruthie uh, spoke about. And they've effectively turned power into a moral category, perhaps the sole moral category. So uh, as I've said before uh, publicly, some of you maybe heard me say that, but I'll say it for, uh, for the listeners on this call. The Jews have made many contributions to religious ideas more than any other people in the history of the world. We also made a contribution to a political idea. We refuse to accept the fact that might makes right. We refuse to accept it, whether it was a Pharaoh, whether it was a Caesar, or whether it was a Fuhrer. We, re- we rejected that idea. Now we live in a world because of this intersectionality where might makes wrong. And you can see the tracing of this in the intellectual world on campuses, where it first was, there is no right and wrong. Then it's might makes wrong. Then might is white, and then Jews are white. Okay, so now you see the whole arc, the intellectual arc of what has happened. Now, whether this Zykus was specifically targeted against the Jews, I'm not sure. But the fact that Black Lives Matter that somebody mentioned would single out Israel. Alone among countries in the world for condemnation should open our eyes to the possibility that this whole thing was an effort to target Jews. And so should the ease, which which is what you write about, Fiamma, that legitimate self-defense of Israel triggers waves of anti-Semitism. There's something there that's making this thing very combustible, that this intellectual powder keg, which makes us think maybe it is intellectual zeitgeist, which I've never actually looked at or thought about, is actually its roots are founded. And you could go to Edward Said and other things that you could talk about is actually founded as an assault against the one and only Jewish state. But even if it's not designed specifically to target the Jews, the alternative theory is no less lethal for human rights. Because if it's not designed to target Israel, it's designed to actually target the free world, which is the foundation of human rights, living in free societies. That's why by the time I finished reading Fiamma's book a second time, It struck me less as a passionate defense of Israel, which it clearly is, but more as an intervention. This is an intervention, an intervention trying to wake up anybody who cherishes human rights. The time is running out if this intellectual madness doesn't stop. And I hope that we will heed her call. Uh, I believe most of the people in Israel are, even beyond the people on this webinar, even beyond the preachers in the choir. I'm somewhat more skeptical skeptical that it will wake up people elsewhere. I'm skeptical because to want to say something, you have to cherish it. And the assault on the values we most cherish is in full throttle, and it has been left largely unchallenged. But the good news is it's not too late. It is getting very late. (laughs) <laughs> but it is not too late. And Fiamma's book then to me, in summary, is it's a real wake up call. And in doing so, you have done a great service to Jews and non-Jews alike. And I'll, I'll just end where I began by thanking you. Uh, thank you for writing the book. And thank you uh, for being, frankly, a great ambassador of our people and an ambassador of the things we cherish most. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Dermer, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for those uh, really insightful uh, observations about Fiamma and about the book. And um, I, I, I think in my overwhelming guilt about getting it wrong that you were the third, not the second longest serving, I gave you an extra five minutes, but it's on my bill. Yeah, so, by the way, gotta... Dan, Dan, you didn't give me anything. I took it. And remember that. <laughs> nobody <laughs> nobody <laughs> gives anything to the Jews. Okay. That's true. That's true. We got to... <laughs> but that's within the context of a free society. You took it, exactly. it still was free. <laughs> exactly. Um, Andrea Levin, it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce you, a- Andrea. And I'm and I'm just gonna go back to the bio if you give me 20 seconds, because I want I want it uh, uh, we have uh, many people on this call and I want them to understand. 
um, that not only you're the executive director and president of camera, that you've held that for, for nearly 35 years. And, uh, you know, uh, camera has built divisions and departments focused on the Christian media campuses, um, uh, as well as an educational institute, um, addressing the issues in, in K to 12 classrooms. You've made that big foray into education in the last years. And you've published, of course, extensively in all the major American media. So media is such an important part of, you know, Fiamma as a, as a, as a decades long journalist and continues to be one of the major journalists in Italy and read throughout Europe. Um, and and I, I don't think there's a greater authority in the United States on media uh, and the influence of, 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 of the public discourse, public policy uh, with regard to Israel and the Middle East than, than Andrea Levin. Andrea, would you share with us um, uh, the ideas that, that you want to, uh, uh, to raise here um, on the issue of the, the media and the 21 conflict with Hamas uh, and, you know, gar I guess, Guardians of the Walls, uh, so-called Operation Guardians of the Walls, to Fiamma's op observation of anti-Semitism destroying the foundations of the contemporary ethos, to quote you uh, in a recent email, Andrea. Th please, the, st the, the platform Thank is yours. You. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. Uh, one, one just small correction on your first reference to uh, my own background. I was not the founder of Camera. I've only been there 30, some 33 years. So, uh, um, so anyway, uh, thank you uh, to to uh, Dory and and to all of all of my fellow panelists for your great work and for being such great friends. Um, uh, the the and congratulations to Fiamma for this this really riveting book. I too read it repeatedly, uh, as as Ron is saying. Uh, really, congratulations for capturing the essentials of our of our perilous moment and the the underpinning lies and hypocrisies and this uh, the onslaught of these so called human rights groups against Israel. There were many points at which I was struck by the book's insights about narratives and lies we're facing in so many arenas. And of course, as, as Dan said, I was constantly reminded of the media in particularly uh, particular agenda setting institutions like the New York Times that are really deeply culpable for not telling the full truth about rising anti-Semitism. And then at the same time, fueling it with biased reporting on the Jewish state. We actually, in this, I, I, I think, Fiamma, your book is really triggered by uh, the 2021 uh, crisis. And it was about that time that we sponsored a billboard opposite the Times newsroom in the wake of that conflict on this very issue, noting that the Times itself uh, has apologized for its disastrous non-coverage of the Holocaust. And we asked why it is now failing again to report the full truth about anti-Semitism. And essentially, this is the nub of Jewish lives matter and the question you're asking. Um, Yama listed the supposed precursor provocations to the 2021 conflict and uh, no, to, to a one, they were overwhelmingly mangled in leading media, whether it was the Temple Mount incitement or the Sheikh Jarrah fictions or the familiar misrepresentations of Israel's alleged disproportionate force in the face of Hamas fire. And it's obvious to all here, if the New York Times had told the full truth on those matters, that there's been a long historic pattern by extremist Muslim clerics inciting hatred and violence against Jews to get to gin up conflict and Sheikh Jarrah is nothing but a failure to pay rent to Jewish owners. And if the Times had ever offered true clarity that a genocidal ent entity Hamas was firing rockets intended to kill innocent civilians and Israel was responding as cautiously as any army can, truly many in the public would have comprehended the realities. And this is the thing that can drive you crazy because you can see what a difference it would make if, if the full truth were shown. 
and told. A snapshot of the extreme anti-Israel perspective, however, that was projected in a significant part of the Times coverage of the conflict is apparent in an analysis by Kemmerz Gilad Aini of the guest op-eds published from the day Hamas first opened fire on Israel on May 10th, 2021 until May 27th. The newspaper published nine anti-Israel guest columns about the alleged misbehavior of Israeli Jews. And there were three that were more or less even-handed guest columns that criticized and empathized with both Israeli Jews and Arabs, and not a single guest column primarily critical of Hamas or Palestinian behavior in the conflict. Nine to zero. The lineup included extreme anti-Israel Jews and Arabs, Peter Beinert, charging Israel, Israel with crimes and promoting the Palestinian demand for a so-called right of return. Bernie Sanders, Yusuf Munayer, Diana Butu, Dahlia Steinlin, Leila Al-Aryan, and Rafat al arir While Arab children, grandparents, wives, and husbands had names and faces and stories, Israelis had no ages and no faces, no brothers or sisters, no Holocaust surviving grandparents, just nameless victims for a paragraph or two, and mostly oppressors, attackers, shooters, and racists. There was no sympathy encouraged for the human beings of Israel. To be clear, after our criticism was published and after communication with editors, the Times did run three guest columns by pro-Israel figures, Zippy Livni, David Walpe, and Danny Dayan. The first of these 17 days after the conflict began and a week after it ended. And it's essential to know that the Times has continued to address some concerns and to correct some errors, including significant ones. Fiamma notes that as, as Dan said, anti-Semitism, quote, destroys the foundations of the contemporary ethos. And surely we are witnessing alarming erosion of core journalistic ethics that require accuracy, balance, fairness, accountability. Recall the infamous open letter signed in June, 2021, after the Gaza conflict by 514 journalists from American outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, Boston Globe, Chicago Tribune, ABC News, Time, The New Yorker, NPR, PBS, and many more of our prestige media. The letter called for the abandonment of traditional journalistic ethics in coverage of Palestine in light of Israel's, quote, military occupation and system of apartheid. The letter cites B'Tselem and Human Rights Watch as proof for their apartheid charges. One of the nine guest columnists in the New York Times damning of Israel was a signer of the letter. Mind you, Amnesty International had not yet published their report, so they weren't included. There were some anonymous signers, journalists afraid to have their names published, but the vast majority endorsed the erasure of ethical journalism in the cause of tearing down the Jewish state. To our knowledge, none lost jobs. Camera, by the way, published its own open letter to the Los Angeles Times, the most prominently represented on the list, deploring this. In many, America, in many areas of American life, it's evident that injection of anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist toxins is disrupting, if not ruining, the normal functioning of, of the entities. Whether it's hijacked student government groups, community groups, women's groups, schools allowing radical ethnic studies curricula promoting virulent anti-Zionist messages. This is a scourge and, and, and the corrosion that you see being caused by it is, is uh, undeniable. A particularly poignant instance of anti-Semitism's corrupting effects 
was the case at State University of New York, New York uh, in, New, in New Paltz. Two Jewish students who were members of a campus group devoted to helping young women recover from sexual assault were harassed and expelled from the group when one posted the following statement on her private Instagram account and the, the other reposted it. Quote, Jews are an ethnic group who come from Israel. This is proven by genealogical, historical, and archeological evidence. Israel is not a colonial state and Israelis aren't settlers. You cannot colonize the land your ancestors are from. The young women were subsequently harassed and stigmatized and expelled from the group for refusing to recant their views for their claim, for there is no claim more intolerable to an Israel hater than the claim of Israel indigeneity in the land of Israel. Hopefully they'll win the lawsuit being brought on their behalf by the Brandeis Center for Human Rights. So that, uh, uh, bravo, bravo and bravo to, to Fiamma for for this pre decur against the oldest hatred and for giving us so much to discuss as we're seeing just in our conversation today. But I, I, I do think that the, the corruption of institutions by the, the poison of anti-Semitism is something that is powerfully visible. And I think her book has illuminated that in, in uh, rooting it in, the the terrible impact of the so-called human rights organizations. So, Fiamma, thank you, and and really uh, much more to be done with this book. And I I hope perhaps the camera can help to make it known and and uh, spread the word. Andrea, thank you uh, very much for uh, zooming out and creating context on the in the media space in this, uh, uh, this real campaign of human rights uh, weaponized and transformed into anti-Semitism and what it means um, both in the, in the micro sense as you monitor the, what you, I think it used to be called bias, today it really is, uh, I think as Ron said, the theater of the absurd in, uh, you know, when, when you take a look at you know, the front page of the New York Times in which Israel appears more than any other issue besides the United States itself on a, a daily basis. Let's turn uh, to our fourth commentator, uh, Professor Charles Small, uh, who's gonna talk about extremism and anti-Semitism. I might say, Charles, one of the, the distinguishing um, elements of your excellence as a professor, as a researcher, an analyst, is that you, you've also taken an historical view. ISGAP takes a, a truly historical view uh, on almost all the issues related to, uh, to Israel-oriented anti-Semitism, the larger international global scene on anti-Semitism. This is a very important theme in, in Fiamma's book is the historical view. You know, the, the Jewish, just as one sentence as we tran uh, transition to Charles, Jewish Lives Matter is an outcome in 2021-22 of historical processes that began a hundred years earlier. And if you look at you know, the type of conspiracy theory literature that the Nazi regime created, that Haj Amin al-Husseini, you know, the first uh, Mufti, uh, British appointed Mufti of, uh, of Jerusalem, Palestinian Mufti or, or Islamic Mufti of Jerusalem had used and the continuation of the conspiracy theory literature against the Jews, both Israel and Jews around the world by the Soviets. And, and, the, and the national liberation movements from Algeria to North Vietnam, in which General Giap said to Arafat himself, turn the entire issue of Palestine into one in which you weaponize human rights. And, and, and that's General Giap, the former commander of the People's Army of Vietnam. That was back in 1968. And here we are discussing Jewish Lives Matter uh, in 2022. So Charles, I'm just gonna use that as a platform to turn it over to you Give us some, you know, a little bit of historical rooting so we can zoom out and understand that this is a st historical strategic program. I think that Fiamma hints at very much of, of the Palestinian strategy 
to uh, uproot uh, uh, Israel, the Jewish people, and, and even democratic uh, states in the free world itself. Charles. Thank, thank you very much, Dan. So first of all, I'm, I'm honored to be uh, here uh, with such a distinguished panel, and it's nice to see you friends. So thank you for having me here. Um, and I'd like to start off by echoing a lot of the accurate uh, compliments and, and recognition of Fiamma, her work, and Fiamma as an individual, as a, as a person. So I'm honored to be here. Um, so nice to see you, Fiamma. Um, and I'd also like to say that I really, you know, admire your, your tenacity, your consistent work over the decades, uh, fighting for human rights and defending the Jewish people. Uh, you're brave. You're also very generous. Um, as as uh, Dan was saying, you're a person that engages ideas. You're diplomatic, but you always stick to pursuing a truth. Um, which is, you're an amazing inspiration and, and a, a wonderful example for those of us who are in the struggle against anti-Semitism and for human rights. And I'd also like to say on a personal note, when we were starting off at ISGA, Fiamma was the first person in kind of the global Jewish-Israeli establishment to, uh, to help give me and my colleagues a platform. You were very generous and I remember invited us to the Italian parliament and to very important events in Rome and around the world. So I, I remember that and you really helped to empower the work of uh, ISGAP and my colleagues. So I wanna uh, thank you for that very much and uh, it's not forgotten. Um, and I'd also like to echo the importance of the book. Um, and I recommend the book to everybody who's listening today. It's a very important uh, piece that provides an overview of the uh, the virulent contemporary anti-Semitism and its manifestations. Um, and I remember I was living in Oxford in England during the uh, May 21 Gaza war and just witnessing uh, the, the disgusting outpour of outpouring of anti-Semitism on the streets of London and even on the streets of Oxford where motorcades were going around Oxford uh, saying all sorts of horrible anti-Jewish and anti-Israeli uh, sentiment on the streets of Oxford in London, um, it, it was, it's horrible. And, and not only is it horrible, but we can see on sort of on the ground, there were extreme uh, Muslim, uh, British people on the streets of London, on the streets of Oxford. But was what is even more troubling, as Fiamma really examines in her book, is the sort of red-green alliance, the acquiescence and even the support of so-called liberal, educated um, Europeans, white Europeans, um, and in the institutions of, uh, of the, perhaps the most, institu most important institutions in our society, the media of record and in education and academia and higher education, the sort of supporting of reactionary social movements like Hamas uh, with, with its roots in the Muslim Brotherhood and even with the Iranian revolutionary regime, sort of political Islam, not to be confused with Islam, but the sort of red-green alliance that's been going on for decades that Fiamma has um, uncovered and examined and shed light. And I think it was Ar uh, Henri Bernard Levy who said that the role of a true intellectual, which Fiamma certainly is, is to shine light where there's darkness. And I think Fiamma has been doing that consistently throughout her work and uh, her writings, her articles, her journalistic articles, her books, and her important uh, political and diplomatic uh, activities in Italy, in Europe, and, and literally around the world. Um, so as, as Dan invited me to say, I think to put the work uh, that we're doing at ISGAP into historical uh, context is that anti-Semitism, unlike other forms of discrimination or hatreds, which can cause tremendous uh, dislocation and violence and, and e even uh, you know, physical violence and vi rhetorical violence, um, that anti-Semitism is inherently genocidal. And I'll be, I'll be crude, there's three types or three phases of anti-Semitism or anti-Semitisms to put into historical context. And I think when 
when the world, when the dominant perspective of the world was through the lens of religion, the Jews were uh, the people that did not accept the Christian notion of the Messiah. And the Jew had to be, in order for the Jew to be saved, they had to accept the Christian notion of the Messiah. And if they didn't, they were blinded by evil. But what makes anti-Semitism inherently genocidal is not just an individual problem, is that until the Jew accepted the Christian notion of the Messiah, they were hindering the redemption of the world, right? So this is where Jews were forcibly converted or exiled and, and, and the like. When the lens shifted from religion to notions of nation and notions of race, the Jews who lived in different parts of the world for many, many generations were suddenly perceived as a different nation or a different race. And unlike in the Christian phase of anti-Semitism, where the Jew can convert to be saved, the notion of race in Western thought, in philosophy, in theology, in the so social sciences, in uh, cultural and social policy, in military policy, that there was this notion that race was something that was inherent in our characteristics. It's something that you could not escape. And no matter, no matter how civilized you were, no matter how many languages you mastered or cultural expressions that Jews mastered, they were always perceived as being of a different race. There was no conversion from this inherent characteristics that people had that were defined biologically uh, by race, ethnicity, and nation. And this type of racist anti-Semitism culminated in the Holocaust. So in order to save the white race or the Aryan race, the Jew had to be removed from society and in, in, the, in the Holocaust uh, exterminated. So those forms of anti-Semitisms in liberal spaces like the media of record, like higher education in Europe and North America is largely a thing of the past in these sort of liberal postmodern spaces. But these old forms of anti-Semitisms have an expression today in the contemporary context to demonize and to delegitimize Israel and notions of who Jews are as a people, as, as, a, as a nation. And not only is this form of anti-Semitism prevalent, but I think in these institutions and societies, in the media of record, in, in higher education, perhaps the most important institutions in our society where young people are educated into society, into uh, learning about certain beliefs and practices, that the onslaught to demonize and delegitimize Israel is not only tolerated, but it's encouraged. And this has become part of, I guess, mainstream or the dominant uh, sort of philo philosophical moment in higher education. And again, the world will be saved when this, as the French uh, ambassador has said uh, years ago, when this shitty little country will, will disappear. And this is sort of legitimized. And we see in Fiamma's book, the sort of red-green alliance happening. So it happens on the streets with sort of the shock troops of anti-Semites, but it's also perhaps more troubling. It's happening in these institutions of the media of record and in higher education. And I think these expressions of the last 40, 50 years uh, are extraordinarily problematic. And I think it's manifested in the sense in many ways and in acquiescing to Hamas, a reactionary social movement that is not only genocidal in its anti-Semitism, like the Muslim Brotherhood, like the Iranian revolutionary regime, like Islamic Jihad and all the other offshoots uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood, that start, the, sort of the reactionary social movement of the Muslim Brotherhood that started roughly 100 years ago in, in Egypt. The, the, this type of uh, acquiescence and the sort of the Red-Green Alliance in higher education, I think justifies, in a sense, the discourse around, for example, the negotiations that are taking place now with Iran, with the Iranian regime, the, the possibility of, a, of another horrible agreement in which the West will give hundreds of billions of dollars to a regime that openly and consistently is dedicated to, towards the destruction, not only of the state of Israel, but to the Jewish people. And that this ideology 
Dan was saying, you know, to look at this historically, this ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is sort of permeated uh, radical political Islam, is rooted in the most pernicious, disgusting, damaging forms of European anti-Semitism, this genocidal hatred. And the West is turning a blind eye yet again to this form of anti-Semitism, that this ideology is rooted in the protocols of the elders of Zion. This forged document lay the groundwork for the Holocaust. Imagine that as, as Elie Wiesel always said that the Holocaust did not begin with the bricks and mortars of the crematorium or of the railroad tracks. It began with words and ideas and the words and ideas of the protocols of the elders of Zion justified removing the Jewish people from society, putting them into ghettos, removing them from, from, from their places of employment, putting them in ghettos, and ultimately culminates in the final solution and the extermination of millions of Jews in, in Europe and North Africa. And that this type of anti-Semitism is given a pass. It's literally given a pass that the West, democratic societies are removing any iota of human decency and human rights in these negotiations. And this, in my view, comes to the fact that for the last 40 or 50 years, uh, education has been hijacked. And Edward Said was mentioned in passing. Edward Said, who was a, a very important uh, intellectual that really shifted the political discourse, he said something that was outrageous 40, 40 years ago, uh, which is now increasingly accepted as a truth. He literally said that the Jewish intellectuals um, are basically squires in the suburbs of America, and they're getting fat in the suburbs of Amer America, and that he is the last remaining Jewish intellectual. He's a Jewish Palestinian, to quote him, and that he was the only last intellectual that inherited the work of the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School, as we all know, was a very important philosophical movement that was created and led by Jewish refugees from the Holocaust, namely Ardarno, Horkheimer, and others. And they were the first intellectuals to try to unpack anti-Semitism in the West and how the Holocaust happened and issues of totalitarianism and anti-Semitism. And if we look at the discourse in the last five or six decades of how academia in the aftermath of the Shoah, was trying to grapple with the failure and perhaps the collapse of Western society and Western mor morality and Western values that culminated in the Holocaust, that we now move to a place in academia, the Frankfurt School looked at the Jews as the victim of anti-Semitism uh, um, and, and how Jews were created as being a separate race, uh, an inferior race and were exterminated. And now we go to academia in 2022, and we see the view of the Jew as white, Zionism as apartheid, and Israel as a colonial racist apartheid state. That this, has, this shift is obscene and yet so important. So the Jews were exterminated because we were not white. And today we're defined as being white and not, you know, sorry for what happened and welcome to the club. No, now the Jew is being portrayed as the quintessential white supremacist elitist, the ultimate colonialist, and the ultimate apartheid supporter, and, and that Israel is an apartheid state. And of course, if Israel is an apartheid racist state, then from a liberal human rights perspective, it has to be dismantled. And this is the discourse. At ISGAP, we're looking at the how funding has influenced the discourse. And we, we're working with people at Princeton University and at Rutgers who are experts in machine learning and artificial intelligence. And what we've been able to do, and what we're gonna start publishing the results in the next few months, is that we have pinpointed where money is coming in. Hundreds of billions of dollars have come into American universities over the last several decades from Muslim Brotherhood and Islamist uh, uh, supporters and entities that have shifted the discourse. And we've now entered thousands of articles of books and journals into this sort of machine learning 
uh, apparatus and, and, and tool. And we can see how, how the funding has helped to shift the discourse uh, when it comes to the Jew, to Israel, and Zionism. And this is articulated by some of the most important philosophers and, and scholars of our time. And this is where journalists are being educated. This is where policymakers are being educated. This is where the future generation of Western leaders are being inculcated into this ideology, which has been in a large part influenced by uh, funding from nefarious sources. Charles, can I can I just uh, interrupt you? We're, we're sure. at 15 minutes and I wanna get to Fiamma because we're only slated for, for an hour and a half and, um, and uh, right. we can continue afterwards uh, for a few sure. minutes if people want to engage. And thank you for that context creator and historical view, extremely important uh, contribution in, in the context of our discussion today and the larger topic at hand. Um, uh, Fiamma, uh, you will get the last word today uh, uh, um, uh, in no uncertain terms. And uh, I'll just say Fiamma, when you know, you grew, in the book, you talk uh, autobiographically, personally uh, about your dad, and your parents having grown up in a, a Zionist home, your dad having been part of the Jewish brigades in Palestine and having been part of the Bund Zionist left and, and your dad having helped to liberate Italy from the Nazis uh, coming from the left, but from positions of pride and freedom and decency as a Jew, as an Italian, having met your mom there and you being an avowed communist as a teenager coming to Israel and working on the kibbutzim and then actually playing an important part in the 67 war where you protected children. Yeah. Uh, so you come from the, you come from the proud far left. So you have a view as, as Ambassador Dermer said, that spans the entire political spectrum so that nobody can pull the wool over your eyes because you've seen it from the right, you've experienced it from the right, you've experienced it in its, in its Islamic and Arab um, uh, 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 embodiment, as you will, as you interviewed Rantisi, you interviewed the, the leaders of Hamas in their homes, fearing that you might be bombed <laughs> from the air. So yeah. you, you, you've interviewed Arafat, you've been there with all of the sources of Islamic, Arab, Western, right-wing and left-wing anti-Semitism, which is why your contribution in this book embodies all of it is so, and so important. And then you mentioned finally, before I give it to you, that your teachers, as Professor Wistrich of Blessed Memory, Bernard Lewis, Professor Lewis of Blessed Memory, and Natan Sharansky and, and, and Ron Dermer, uh, through their extraordinary book, uh, The Case for Democracy, became in a way a guide for you as well, and an influence upon you in the modern period. So share with us some of the, as Ron said, the passion and the intellect uh, uh, behind your indictment and your warning uh, indictment of the human rights community, as it were, and your warning to us all about what the risks are if we don't act now uh, in the name of real human rights uh, and in the name of moral clarity. Fiamma. First um, of all, what I can communicate now is my deep emotion. You can imagine how, how much I feel about this group that is here now this presentation uh, that is done with some of my best friends. And I want to say that it's not thank here that I'm telling you, it's just love that I'm telling you, please <laughs> let me tell you that. Uh, it's much more than thank. And this thank I want to extend to Dan, to Dory, to Jennifer, to Auba, to, to Daniel, uh, to the translator, Amy Rosenthal, to David Hornick that did such a wonderful work uh, uh, together with me to just to, to try to, to arrive to the Italian feeling that, that was in the, in the first, uh, in the first um, edition of the book. And uh, whatever you have said until now is all the book. I don't have to add anything about it. You know, you, you, you already explain what is there. You have said even more than what is there. I thank you so much for that. It's a little book. It's just uh, something that came up with the rage, specific rage uh, uh, after the crisis uh, 
of 2021 and um, and then uh, that it became larger and larger and I went back to issues that I already described in other books so but it's it's very important to whatever has been said here today by all of you um, and uh, and it's very very important the issue that uh, that has been uh, raised here that nowadays this this um, and which is the main subject of the book that is the the fact that when um, when the the word engages so much in anti-Semitism, so so that every about every eighty seconds uh, a, a new post appear on the social in twenty different lang languages uh, against the Jews all over the world it takes millions and millions of posts against the Jews. When uh, such a phenomena appears in most in the most horrific way shouting death to the Jews in so many different places uh, all over the world. The danger for the world that we have tried to raise, that we have invented after the Second World War that looked like it been destroyed forever, whatever was decent, whatever uh, we wanted, uh, uh, whatever the, the Jews could have uh, thought about, uh, as a world where it was possible to live, where this danger is present, is alive, is here. And if we don't do something, the world will be destroyed by the same organization that have been created after the Second World War to be the guards of this world that we wanted to recreate after Nazi fascists that has killed the 6 million Jews and that has destroyed, first of all, Germany in the name of anti-Semitism. Secondary Europe, don't forget that anti-Semitism has not destroyed only 6 million Jews, has destroyed also Germany, has destroyed, I mean, the creator of this situation, okay, has also destroyed the Europe itself, all of it. And we have been saying that just because there was a, a strong power, the United States, that were ab able to keep their uh, head out of it and were able to come and fight for us. And th this is the this is the truth. Otherwise, whatever was germinated, whatever was created in the same atmosphere, in the same uh, uh, situation where anti-Semitism was born, were destroyed. That's the story. Now, when UNESCO says that Jerusalem has never been an, a Jewish heritage and it is an Arab heritage, it would be ridiculous and laughable if it was not a tragedy. And what does it say to us? Nothing interesting, actually. I don't mind, I don't give a damn about what they say. What is important is that this creature of the United Nations that also was created after the Second World War, to take care of the most important and beautiful uh, creation of uh, humanity has failed. Nobody will do it because it doesn't exist anymore. If they tell us that Jerusalem has nothing to do with the Jewish people, what are they telling us? If uh, this girl that is an Italian girl, unfortunately, uh, Francesca Bruzzese, that is now in charge of a bench of the ICC, tells us that the, the Palestinian situation is comparable to the Nazi Holocaust. Uh, and she's in charge with a lot of money from the United Nations and without a, a definition even of a time when this uh, situation expires to keep going with this terrible research uh, about the, the sins of Israel because this is her with Nabi Pillai, yes, Nabi Pillai, the truth, he wrote a beautiful piece about it. Uh, on, 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 uh, what, uh, how can we trust the United Nations anymore? When the European Union uh, finds, you know, the European Union is so much divided inside, every single nation of the European Union, think about Germany and France, there cannot be two more divided space. Italy never knows exactly what to do over there. Sometimes it's with Germany, and sometimes with France. Now everything is divided because of um, energy. That's a big issue nowadays during this uh, war. 
But whenever they meet, uh, they have a rule. The, the, the foreign ministers must agree to arrive to a conclusion. How do they found the unity, unity of the European Union, voting something against Israel? That's the only way they find unity. Do you, do you realize that this is the way that Europe can find its unity? And also I think that in, in the university and the newspapers and I mean, in this fragmented words, word that doesn't find unity of, of, of anything. And wherever you look around, you find uh, only wars between different parts and, in, and inside the different group, conservatives and progressive and liberal, there are little war all inside. Where do they find unity against Israel? This is where they all say, and even the conservatives do it most of the times, that the territories are occupied, which everybody knows that is not true. Go and read Alan Baker, one of my friends at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. It's not true. They are not occupied. They are disputed, and uh, and uh, you find a lot of proofs of that. But go and suggest it. They will say no. Why that? Because uh, history has brought them to a point where the contemporary world, the culture of this contemporary world, has been so uprooted so much being turned upside down uh, that the only place where they can find a unit is the ancient story of anti-Semitism. Now, uh, and I won't, won't go deep into that. You find a lot about it in, in, in the book and the, or wherever else in all the studies that my friends here and some other friends uh, have been writing the, on, the, on the conference that, where they have been discussing. I want to try to go a little step further here because I am with you. It's the first time in history that anti-Semitism is against the state of Israel because it's the first time in Israel that the state of Israel exists. The Jewish people was in the hands of anti-Semitism before, okay? It's no more. Now it's against the state of Israel. We have written books and books and books. I have done it, but before me, with more important pens, like uh, Robert Bistrick, that then has quoted, uh, have done it. It's a, it's a mathematical, algebraic demonstration that uh, nowadays, and uh, also uh, Nathan and Ron in their books, that by the way, I have translated into Italian and prefated. I don't know if you know that, Ron, and I have distributed everywhere and has been presented in the Italian parliament and also um, the, the, I mean the, the fact is that this uh, the, 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 if you if you if you look at what anti-semitism is today, is something that has its main, most important, uh, most relevant, and almost unique aim in the destruction of the state of Israel. I don't need to go back to that and to demonstrate that the, the, the anti-Semitism of today is a hate for Israel because uh, there, are, there are books and uh, and uh, dissertations uh, and the studies about that that very very in a very substantial way uh, include the Israelophobia that we have uh, worked at together with them uh, describe and the, some of my books do it. So there is no doubt. But do we really believe it? We don't. We don't because if we did believe it, the state of Israel would have done much more to fight it. We don't believe it. We don't believe that anti-Semitism today. We keep uh, leaving the people that is in charge uh, in the struggle against anti-Semitism, uh, keep uh, keeping the fight uh, either on this saint uh, struggle to, to, to keep the memory of the Holocaust. That's uh, something that cannot be avoided and must be kept uh, forever, that's for sure. But it's not the only thing that must be done. Studies and we need to keep in mind that whatever moves around the world against the state of Israel, uh, according to the 3D uh, uh, um, blueprint nation, 
is anti-Semitism. This anti-Semitism is a destructive anti-Semitism that falls on the people of Israel and on the Jewish people all over the world. We have to invent, because we are the first one that faced this kind of anti-Semitism, to invent a totally different diplomatic and, uh, and um, cultural way of facing it. We can't, do you understand what I mean? Or I, uh, I, I, maybe it's too short when I echo. Mm, I think that uh, we must, first of all, considering that it is the world of human rights, included uh, institutions, uh, NGO, uh, pretended uh, uh, left-wing Jews that uh, are uh, actually more and more demonstrating that uh, they don't care about the future of the state of Israel. Taking into consideration that nowadays the most important uh, source of anti-Semitism, because it's a destructive uh, and a genocide source, is Iran. So we have to take all of these very important things into consideration and uh, to, mm. to put on a, a completely new theoretical and practical uh, um, uh, um, start uh, 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 our fight against anti-Semitism. We must be the defenders of the rights of minorities. They can't do it uh, anymore of freedom of religion, of freedom of political opinion, whoever infringes that, the states that do it must be accused by us, by Israel, by the Jews of doing it. Because we know that the word of, uh, of uh, human rights will not do it. The people that attack Israel, attacks these values in, no, in name of organizations, uh, that have nothing to do with human rights. You know, I think about uh, all the discussion about, um, uh, uh, about terror. And I remember, and this is something that Dan just touched, uh, by the way, and I thank him for doing that. All of my experience about the issue of anti-Semitism comes from there for having spoken and interviewed anti-Semite uh, one after the, the other, from uh, the people of Hamas to the uh, leftists, uh, to, to the Jewish uh, people that became uh, themselves anti-Semites. I've been doing that. And also, I mean, I remember uh, running after even right wings anti-Semites. And what I have checked is that the, the criteria that they violate are not only Mm, the principles that mm, are close uh, to the definition of the Jewish people. They do not say bad things only about the Jewish people. They violate all the principles of freedom of speech, freedom of, uh, uh, you know, they are against. They don't give a damn about seeing uh, the homosexuals in Iran hang uh, in the streets. They don't care about seeing uh, women persecuted, uh, uh, children in Gaza <clears throat> marrying the people of 50, 60 years old uh, and uh, making out of it a, a big party. They don't, they don't care. They will never denounce the fact that uh, three days ago in Hamas, uh, they have uh, uh, declared uh, uh, culpable uh, five people and killed them, either hanging or shooting them. Who cares? If we have somebody in a hunger strike, then they flock here and write articles about that, but they will not take. And so we have to attack it, you know? We have to, to go toughly about it. We, 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 must, uh, 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 we must understand that to fight anti-Semitism, we have to fight this organization and these people that even signed the IFRA. We keep defending ICRA and saying uh, everybody must sign ICRA. I wrote a little book about that uh, by the JCPA. L go and look at that. You will find that most of, this, of the states and most of the people that signed ICRA then not only do not defend Israel uh, in the institution, I mean, not only they do not defend Israel 
they are the ones that promote anti-Semitism. Can you just explain for our audience what IRA is, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism that asserts for the first time ever since 2016 that uh, calling Israel a racist uh, 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 venture or entity is, is, is a form of anti-Semitism. And that's a, that's a breakaway concept. So when Fiamma talks about IRA, that's what she's referring to is this yes, massive now, state uh, agreement with IRA. Now we made the research about it and we discovered that also the many states that have signed IRA and, uh, and uh, many people that belongs to institution that signed IRA actually not only that they do not, do not uh, uh, behave according to the IRA propositions, but also they promote anti-Semitism. You will find it in the book, I'm not going to. So what I'm saying here today is that we must, the one that first and foremost, are the one that believe in what we have discovered uh, in this last uh, 10 years uh, so accu accurately, that anti-Semitism today is mostly a persecution and uh, an attempt to destroy the state of Israel. If we ourselves do not believe it, we will not be able to fight it. Yes. And if we do, we have to sit and define and think about a new way of taking in our hands, not according to the old, uh, uh, to the old style of fighting anti-Semitism. The old style is gone. We, we have a few crazy fascists that, you know, can, we can quietly ignore them. They, they, are, they can write a post, but they cannot write a post every 80 seconds uh, in millions and millions all over the world against that. I finished telling you that um, it's the first time that during the electoral campaign, I'm in Italy now, as an Israeli and an Italian, mostly as an Israeli, because this is the way I feel inside my heart and everybody knows that. There is an electoral campaign that is going to end up uh, in a few days because uh, they are voting on the 25th and on the 25th of this month. There are people for the first time on the left that have used anti-Semitism um, as an electoral slogan, you know? It has never happened in Italy before. It's a guy that said, I, I believe uh, it's the, he wrote on, his, on a post, uh, he wrote, yes, the state of Israel, I believe in the state of Israel as I believe in extraterrestrial, in extra, how do you say that? Oh. Extraterrestrial forces. Extraterrestrial. Yes. Yes. Wow. That was, he's, a, he's in the PD. I mean, the, the main, the most important left-wing party. There was a scandal about it. And being Italy still a decent party from this point of view, he was expelled from the list because of this. There were, there were plenty of articles about the issue, included the, one of mine. And at, at the end, uh, we succeeded in making him exclude by, from, the, from the list. But it was used in the electoral campaign. And I want to tell you, Italy is being a decent place that still expels people like that from the, list, from the electoral list. Still, in the United Nations, and uh, in the European Union, when there is one of these unitarian motion voting against Israel, votes with them. It's an illness. These uh, institutions are the first thing that we must keep in mind when uh, we again uh, uh, say we will fight anti Semitism, we will win because the Jews all over the world are not alone today. We, the state of Israel will defend you. This is what we have to repeat to them. The state of Israel is the one that is mostly attacked. The state of Israel is the one that will mostly defend them. The state of Israel is our luck, is our happiness. And I, and I am sure, like I think that it was Golda Meir that says, oh, being Jewish is a wonderful thing. Once in their lifetime, people should experience that. <laughs> At least once in their lifetime, <laughs> Anybody, everybody should experience that. Okay, I will stop. Fiamma, you started were, were, uh, a couple of things. You started your comments 
um, um, you started your comments by uh, charging Israel or, or challenging Israel to yeah. fight this new version, this new virulent uh, um, and metastasizing form of anti-Semitism. And you argued it's actually a fascinating topic for a, an entire session with this panel on what is the state of play in Israel and why um, the is uh, Israeli uh, uh, governments, uh, including the current government and past governments, have not taken a more aggressive view of this ideological and political war um, that, uh, that has masqueraded as human rights, but is actually uprooting and undermining Israel and the, and the Jewish collective's international legitimacy. And as the Jerusalem Center, uh, uh, Yossi Cooperwasser from the Jerusalem Center, um, who has been on this call, has said repeatedly, the national security of the Jewish people is based on Israel's international legitimacy. To the extent at which Israel does not have, or is international legitimacy is depreciated, amortized, um, or chipped away by this type of political and ideological warfare that has been carried on for the last century, Israel and the Jewish people, and, and in this discussion, the rest of the free world will be in, in deep trouble. And let me announce, Fiamma, that the Jerusalem Center is uniquely positioned to take on in a massive international public diplomacy program, the, your, the ideas in your book and create uh, an initiative that exposes, educates and engages elites from governments to parliaments, to um, opinion shapers uh, and, and the media uh, and, and others in a top-down approach as well as social networks in order to lead the charge of this virulent form uh, of anti-Semitism and threat against the very foundations of the free world. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, I, I call to the 150 people on this call to partner with us on this because uh, we're, we're experts in, in, in mm -hmm. packaging and executing on these programs. And our intention is, is to do it with these wonderful and distinguished colleagues on this call um, in a uh, implementable, measurable, definable, uh, a, a program where we will turn the dial um, using the ideas in Jewish Lives Matter, which, by the way, can be downloaded free of charge at the jcpa.org website, um, or it can be ordered in hard copy from Amazon, if I'm correct on that, um, Fiamma, right? You can order it physically. You can also order it from the Jerusalem Center. I think we have, we have copies here, but it's, um, it's a very readable monograph and one that when you read it and you'll understand what the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs is capable of doing on this point with Fiamma uh, uh, leading the charge together with all of us uh, running shoulder to shoulder, uh, as I said, to governments, parliaments and media and opinion elites around the world, uh, I think we really can make a, a, a profound difference uh, in, the, in the discourse on, on this particular point. Fiamma, did you wanna say last word? I wanna say a couple of things about very, very quickly. First of all, I think that the point that Ron raised of the, uh, of the difficult of def defining the right of self-defense of a democracy at war has been, uh, is, a, is something that has been uh, developed very, very, very deeply. It is something that has to take all of our consideration. It's a very, very clever mm -hmm. point that has to be yeah. discussed to understand how we fight the issue of anti-Semitism because it's very much based on the idea uh, that a country at war is a guilty country. And we, Israel, sometimes uh, just feeling guilty, never took enough courage to counter the accusation that we're doing, that, they, that the world was doing to us just, be, just because we are at war, as if uh, being at war was a guilt of our own. You know, after the Second World War, all the ideology that has been built either uh, during uh, uh, the Cold War and afterward in the institutions that I have mentioned before have always been criminalizing the concept itself of war. And when a democracy tries to, to defend itself, uh, at keeping a democracy, instead of, um, of understanding how incredibly heroic is uh, to do such an effort, how great it is to see a democracy uh, fighting this uh, this uh, this struggle 
uh, at the cost of losing lives and living in a continuous okay. danger. What is the uh, email address? We have been uh, we 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 have been uh, criminalized because we are at war and not be, and we have not never had enough uh, um, courage to push back the the accus accusations. Um, also, I think that this kind of of a fear of not being enough perfect uh, is the things that has kept us uh, uh, far, uh, far away from being able to, to refuse uh, the vile accusation that are done to us. For instance, Andrea, the fact that we are so deeply defenders uh, of the of, um, right uh, of opinion, of the uh, right of uh, free uh, press, uh, uh, always keep us a step back from attacking the newspaper and uh, to find a newspaper that really will attack as, as you courageously do the New York Times. They don't do it, the, the Jewish don't do it because uh, they are afraid to be accused not to. So we have to overcome, to fight this kind of anti-Semitism, we have to overcome, first of all, our fears. This is what, this is what I feel, but you all have said that today, I think, no? Yes. Also about the movements, uh, each and every one of us, when you speak about intersectionality, I myself, I speak about uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, I say, even if the fight of the Black people is, uh, is something that all of us have to appreciate all along the tens of the years that the Black people has fought for, for its own emancipation, huh? Still today, no, we have now to face the things that they are nowadays and to be able to, to face the reality. Look, uh, we are afraid of the, of the way the United Nations and the European Union uh, can uh, put us uh, beyond the pale and, and, uh, and are very, very careful never to offend and never to... But sometimes we have to use all of our weapons to stop them. I mean, I'm speaking about moral weapons, of course, moral and uh, scientific and, uh, you know, there are many, many things that uh, we can, uh, that we can do to stop anti-Semitism. We must start uh, discussing.